Today's message is the worldwide liberation movement. When I use that term, the worldwide liberation movement, it kind of frames in your mind a picture of something very positive, doesn't it? The worldwide liberation movement. Who would stand against anything like that? You know, the Bible says that the children of this world are more shrewd than the children of light, and they often think this way. So if they want to get us to buy into something, they'll give it a nice name. And I'm not making a statement positive or negative against it. I'm just saying we'll call it the Affordable Health Care Act, <laughs> regardless of whether it makes it any more affordable. Right? But you see, there's, there's a wisdom in that. Let us take something that we want people to buy into and let us frame it in a light that makes people say, yes, of course, I, I buy into that 100%. And so when I think about the gospel of Jesus Christ, if we, if we use the term the Great Commission or evangelism, there are immediate impressions on people's minds that have come often from culture and not from God's word. So if I call it the worldwide liberation movement, because that's what it is. It's the worldwide liberation movement. The kingdom of God has come and it is breaking forth in the earth. And wherever it goes, those who are in slavery go free. Those who are in bondage and oppression go free. Those who are in darkness see the light. It is liberation for all. And that's exciting, isn't it? See, perception and expectation is an important battleground that we're going to talk about today. Because how people perceive something has a direct impact on how they relate or receive or reject something. And their expectation of what they're receiving plays a role. Here, I got something for you. You know what I mean? One of my favorite ones in the whole world. This one gets me every time. Oh, yuck. Oh, yuck. Here, try this. <laughs> you see, I've already created an expectation, haven't I? Right? And so there are language sets an expectation, but we're fighting a perception in this world that, that the Great Commission is the global mission of tyranny to bring people into bondage and oppression. It's to bring a cruel, oppressive morality and keep people from having fun. I mean, the, the world works really hard to set the expectation. It's imperialism. It's racist. And when you put these terms on it, it robs it of its victory in life. And it also does something else in the people of God. It makes us in some ways ashamed of the God, I'm ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's offensive to this world. Now, that's not Paul at all, is it? But when you see this is the worldwide liberation movement, then you say with Paul, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God to set free, to bring life, to deliver, to heal, to tear down the walls of racism and oppression of every sort, like we heard yesterday. When you use critical theory and intersectionality, when you pit people against one another, oppressor and the oppressed, victim and victimizer, what you're doing is you're creating more bitter angerness and division. But when you unite, all people are created in the image of God and have been create, given by their creator certain inalienable rights in dignity and worth and value and significance and that all lives do matter and that we see not the color of skin but we see people created in the image of God for whom Jesus shed his blood and we let the love of God through the gospel come into our hearts it has the power to break down every wall every division to heal everything in society it really does. It's the only power that can save. And see, once a bad idea gets out there, and once a bad conviction gets out into the culture, it's like a disease. 
It's like a sick sickness. It puts COVID-19 to shame. In the vaccine, there's only one thing that can deal with it. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a deadly poison that has gone out and it is killing people. And the gospel is the only way of salvation. The only way to be healed. The only thing that tears down walls of separation between us and God through the cross and us and one another. It's the truth. It tears down every wall of separation. And it is the only thing that can bring liberty and freedom and satisfaction to a world. So to give us... You know, the world has framed so many things in a negative way, and it really is a disease that is so easily caught, and it affects us in ways sometimes that we don't even realize. So I want to read from Acts 17, 29 to 30 to ponder how this could be taken. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now God commands all men everywhere to repent. See, when you read that passage kind of with today's perceptions, I've been told to take the mic away when I... <laughs> well, when you read that with today... Oh, look, she, she's saying I can be trained. <laughs> when you read that with today's perceptions, it's kind of like people are worshiping the gods of they choose. And their culture, is, what are, who can you say that your culture is it better than anybody else's culture? What right, do you have, what right do you have to judge any other culture? And they worship other gods and idols. And how dare you be so obnoxious to say God commands them to repent? And you can see how that thinking can get in there, right? And, and we as Christians, when we really believe and know the truth, this is the worldwide liberation movement. And we understand that culture is a product of the God that we worship. Then we have no problem saying God commands all men everywhere to repent. Because now let's reframe that whole passage another way. It says, the times of ignorance God overlooked. Why did God overlook they, that the world was worshiping idols? And you, all these perceptions are so intertwined. Because God is a cruel tyrant that wants to strike them dead for worshiping idols, you sick, terrible sinners. No. God understood that before Jesus died and rose again, before he tore down the wall of separation, the power had not yet been released in the world to change people from the inside out. And so what he said is, so if you understand this properly, and when you understand idolatrous cultures, they are fatalistic, they are oppressed, they are groaning under misery. It's not a kind of life that people would celebrate. And he's saying to the world, God overlooked those times of ignorance. Why? Because the gospel had not yet been brought forth because Christ had not yet died. And it basically, it's kind of like, hold on, just hold on. He is coming, he is coming, the king is coming. And when he comes, a liberation movement will begin to break you out of tyranny and oppression and out of everything that robs you of life. And now that the kingdom has come, God commands all men everywhere to repent because he does not want to see people living under tyranny and oppression and in darkness. See how you frame it? With a good understand, the true understanding brings life and it makes you confident and bold and in love with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the question we should really ask ourselves can you turn that up a little bit? I lost my voice thanks to a puppy this morning. He decided he didn't like the rain and decided that he will just stay inside in times when he should be outside. You can figure that one out. But a question that we need to really ask ourselves is this. Do you really believe that the gospel will set the world free? Do you believe it is the only way to set the world free? Then when we go out and we share the gospel, we are not forcing something oppressive 
on people, but we are sharing with them the only way out. And it's exciting, isn't it? It's exciting. So I really want to explore this concept of a worldwide liberation movement. And so I'm finally going to read a passage from Revelation. Because I was promised last time. Revelation 19, 11 through 16. Now, before I, before I, now I decided to go at a backwards rabbit trail. The book of Revelation, that word means the unveiling, right? And it was, it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. But it was given to John on the Isle of Patmos. It was given during a time of great persecution. And Nero's persecution was horrific. I mean, you almost don't even want to talk about what they did to Christians in the times of Nero. Because it's so disgusting and atrocious. How bad the culture was in the days of Nero. And so this message or this revelation was given to a church that was being terribly persecuted, looking, facing down the greatest world power in history, and by, by the eyes of the flesh, everything looked impossible. And in that, with the eyes of the flesh, there would be a temptation to lose heart. But when we lift up our eyes to heaven and ask for a fresh word from heaven, he brings a word that revives, that empowers, that thrusts us out again with boldness and confidence. He gave a revelation of Jesus Christ. And when you unpack it, that book is an amazing book that gives hope and faith and revives and restores and brings morale to the people of God under heavy persecution because it declares the reality that Jesus is Lord. And in that context, Revelation 19, 11 through 16, paints a picture of the worldwide liberation movement. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written so that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes forth a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. In a time of great darkness and oppression, John has this vision. I see the captain of the armies of heaven. The Lord Jesus Christ riding out to war on a horse. Who else is the King of kings and Lord of lords? Who else is the word of God? And his eyes are like a flame of fire. And out of his mouth proceeds a two-edged sword. It says he will rule the nations with a rod of iron. I mean, all of this imagery is the imagery of a victorious campaign that I'm calling this morning the Worldwide Liberation Movement. See, a lot of people will stumble upon a lot of that language. The fierceness of the wrath of God. He, he will rule them with a rod of iron. What, are, what is he saying here is, I'm going to set the world free. And with power and authority, I am not going to allow anything to overcome. To continue to oppress and to bring into bondage. He says, I am angry that my people have been treated like animals. I am angry that my people have been brought low and lost human dignity and worth and value. I am angry that people have been deceived and that nations have been deceived. And I am riding forth to set them free. In the instrument that goes forth to set the nations free is the word of God. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Through the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
The Lord is conquering the nations. Let that set in. Better way to frame it to make people happier. Through the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Lord is liberating the earth and setting the people free. Isn't that exciting? It's such a word of hope in a time when everything seemed hopeless. It gave such a picture of how do we overcome in the face of great evil. We overcome through the gospel of Jesus Christ. It has the power to save nations. And right there in that passage, he kept saying again, nations, nations, nations. He will rule the nations. God has always been concerned about nations, and I challenge every person to go and read the scripture from cover to cover and find out if that's true. Because God has a heart to set all people free, and he cares about all of our life. He doesn't just care about our psychological freedom. He doesn't just care about our emotional freedom. He doesn't just care about our personal holiness. He cares about every aspect of our lives, including how heavily we are taxed, including how we are manipulated and deceived and oppressed and stolen from. God, God hates stealing, even when it's done by the government. Right? And God, the gospel has the power to set us free in every way. Yes, psychological freedom. Yes, freedom from addictions. Yes, freedom from despair and hopelessness. Yes, reconciled relationships and families. And yes, an end to government theft and tyranny and oppression. There is no area of life that God doesn't care about. And there's nothing that oppresses us that the gospel of Jesus Christ doesn't deliver us from. Isn't that exciting? And I'm hoping to, that people will wake up and see where do we find hope in times like this? We see, we see Jesus riding a horse, conquering the nations through the gospel of Jesus Christ. So this vision, you know, this picture is being painted. Jesus is conquering the nations, worldwide liberation movement through the word of God. So I just want to read um, Paul, because the scripture, the more we get into scripture, the more it inspires us and helps us to see. And you get the picture when you read between the lines of what their perception and expectation is. So Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. For though we walk in the flesh and hear this well and let this sink in how do we win though we walk in the flesh we do not war according to the flesh for the weapon see we don't win by marxist revolution matter of fact it's the opposite of what we want but we don't win with swords we don't win with tanks we win through changing people from the inside out through the gospel of jesus christ when we remember that this is God's strategy to save the world, then it gives so much dignity to what we're doing at church. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. Hear what he's saying. This is not just dead words. Paul's saying, we have been given mighty weapons. We have been given weapons that are more powerful than any weapons that any army in the history of the world has ever had or ever will have. The most powerful weapon we can think of is the nuclear bomb. And Paul is saying our weapons that we actually have are more powerful than any weapon in this world. And they're powerful to pull down strongholds. They're powerful to cast down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Do we believe that? And then it really gets into the battle by saying, bringing every thought into the captivity to the obedience of Christ. Because almost everything that we are suffering under in this world was birthed by as a bad idea. 
Marxism was a bad idea that came along after evolutionary thinking came from Darwin, another bad idea, wed with Hegel, another bad idea, and now we, now we perceive the world as survival of the fittest. Wow, that's not the world we live in. That's not my father's world. You see what I'm saying? We are just a product of chance. Just, you know, no dignity, no worth, no value. It's not my father's world. Every thought, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God can be cast down. But we have to dare to believe that God has given these weapons to the church of Jesus Christ. And the two most powerful weapons are the ministry of the word and prayer. So being ready to punish all disobedience once your obedience is fulfilled. Basically, they're in. I'm not going to read other translations for time's sake. But the imagery there is so clear. Once your mind has been cleared of the fog. Once your mind and your perception and your expectation has come into the agreement with Christ. So that you see things as you should and believe as you should. You'll have the power to bring this world into the obedience of life. Of freedom. Of the rule of God's law. The rule of his love. To set the world free. But it's, see how he, he talks about all of this power that is invested in the church. And yet he brings it down to the practical element of us renewing our minds. And bringing our thoughts into the obedience of Christ. As I was saying a few weeks ago, the gospel is life-giving. It's like a light. And that light is real. And when we live in the place of the light of God's presence, we remember the Lord. We remember his goodness. We remember his faithfulness. We, we, our trust in him starts to skyrocket and our appreciation just starts to flow into prayer and praise and thanksgiving unto the Lord. And I was saying like people I know who had addictions to going to strip clubs and were trying to break out. And I'm saying that people in their mind and in their heart often wander into various degrees of darkness that are just as bad as that. Because it stops the living water from flowing out of us. We feel weighed down. We feel heavy. We feel discouraged. We feel like there's no hope. We feel like we are worthless. We start to believe that this world has no hope as well. Our situations have no hope. We are wandering in places of darkness and God says repent come back out and come into my presence come back into my light and be alive again live again so that you can give life to the world and so many people keep feeding on things in their mind and soul that without realizing it they keep getting darkened and they become part of the problem rather than the solution where the solution is keep our mind in obedience to Christ. Keep alive in the spirit and know that when we keep ourselves alive in the spirit and obedient to Christ. Now our conversation with the world is infectious. It has the ability to infect the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ and cause them to come to know him. Because that's ultimately the goal to know him. To know our Father in heaven. To come into his presence boldly because of the blood that was shed. And to walk with God all the days of our life. And to live in the household and family of God. So, it's the, so we see that these powerful weapons for pulling down strongholds. In Bible study they talked about prayer. And I'm only going to focus on the word of God today. Because we saw that that was... The sword by which he was using to subdue the nations. The power of God's word. Hebrews 4, 12 through 13 says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, 
piercing even the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. The word of God is living and powerful, and we have to believe that. We need to remember it because so many times Christians live at the level of duty. I'm a Christian, so I pray and read God's word, and it's a duty, and it becomes drudgery. I mean, I try to make the Christian life simple. Find what gets you on fire for God and in love with Jesus and alive in him and feed on it unapologetically. But I'm telling you, if we can get you to dare to believe that the scriptures are God's word. And when God's word was put in the hands of the common people, it changed the whole world. It always does. When people really believe that this is God's word and they, they read it as God's word. It starts to change everything. They start to say, preacher, you, you get it right. You got it wrong. Oh, you're right, sir. Forgive me. And then the Pope says, oh, you know what? Kill you. Oh, no, okay. Game on. Right? You know, emperor, you're wrong. God's word said these are the boundaries and limits. God's word empowers people. It always does. And when we believe that when we are feeding on his word, it's living and powerful and sharp and something starts to happen in our life. Because we start to see everything differently in our, in our world and we start to have hope and encouragement. It starts to transform us in such a way. It may not happen in one day. I read God's word and nothing happened. I read God's word and nothing happened. But when we keep feeding on God's word day in and day out before we know it, we are wandering in realms of glory, hearing the voice of our Father, and, and his presence becomes a reality. And that presence is real and powerful. And it's, it's amazing what can happen when the presence of God is manifested. It's like the things that were darkness or like gibberish, all of a sudden they come alive. And people have a divine encounters with the living God. It's like living in the darkness. And I, was, I remember when I met the, I believed the gospel with my whole heart. But I met the Lord at 19. And the best way to describe the numerous parts of the encounter, it was like a light was shining. And all of a sudden, I saw reality. The secrets of my heart were exposed. I had been a product of our culture, believing that I was loving people and accepting people and not judging anybody. And all of a sudden, I saw reality. And I saw that I was serving sin. And I was part of the problem. You see, and there are people out there, and we know, it's like their motives are good. We want to love people. We want to be good. We want to be a blessing. But if there's not a power that can break them out of the strongholds that they are in and bring their minds into the obedience of Christ, they will continue in bondage. But these weapons of our warfare in the worldwide liberation movement are powerful to liberate the captives out of their strongholds. But he brought it back. Being ready to do this once your obedience is fulfilled. Walk in the light as he is in the light. Feed on my word and be on fire for Jesus. I mean, it's really not that complicated, is it? And it doesn't mean you have to read the word of God in its pure, unadulterated form. You can read, you know, a lot of times in my life, it's I'll read books that expound on God's word or are connected to God's word unapologetically because I'm finding God's word in it. And it's getting me madly in love with Jesus. You know, it's not legalistic. You know, I think the greatest way that we impact the world is by ingesting God's word so much that it comes, seeps out of us everywhere. It's like there was a certain food when we were in Belfast called a kebab. But it's different, it's different in Britain than it is here. And it's, they put it on non bread and it's kind of like gyro meat. And then they put garlic sauce on it. You, you can see where I'm going with this, right? 
and you usually carry the odor for two days after you eat it. So it was like Stephanie, when she was pregnant, was like, no. One night I was like, hey, you mind if I get a kebab? She goes, I don't mind if you get a kebab if you want to sleep on the couch. I said, okay, that's worth it. Went and got a kebab. And <laughs> <laughs> but but the thing is when we ingest God's word it's just like that except in a good way <laughs> it seeps out of us everywhere and it starts to color everything we do and so we ingest God's word and ingest God's word and without even realizing it we are ministering to a world that's in darkness Feeding them the words of life because we can't help it. Because it's seeping out of us everywhere. Because we keep ingesting it. That's the Christian life. Making discipleship easy. Mm. The power of a life lived in God's presence. I, I just can't get away from this enough. You know, Martin Luther. I, I just love our fathers in the faith, because he, his directions to people was simple. Read God's word. I read it two hours every morning, he said. If I'm really busy, then I'll do three hours. And when God starts speaking to you, listen. Because he knew that if I get you reading God's word, you're hearing the Father speak to you, and he will speak to you. But it's not just about the literal duty, duty. It's about a relationship. Having fellowship with the Father. Hungry to sit at His feet and hear His stories. And next thing you know, you're in God's presence. See, prayer without the presence of God. Church without the presence of God. Reading God's Word without the presence of God is boring. I'll just be honest. It's boring. You know? Now, I'll be, it's, it's, it's a fine line. I'll be honest. There's times in my life it's like, oh, there's no God's presence not here. God's presence not here. The problem is with me. Right? And I needed to repent and reconnect with God's presence. But there are times when God's presence isn't there and I'll be in a service going, God, please get me out of here. Lord, God, please get me out of here because I'm hungry for your presence and I'm not finding it and I've already searched my heart. Now, you say, okay, well, that's your fault, preacher, because you stunk today. Okay, you know, well, the problem is nobody can be 100% all the time. But they can be if, the, if all of us are unified in prayer. God, please let your presence come. Lord, please let your glory be revealed. Lord, let the rivers of living water flow because we are a community. And there's something about hunger. There's something about expectancy in the people of God that brings it out. And then you say, wow, well, what an awesome preacher. He's the best preacher ever. Wow, I've never seen a better preacher. And the preacher is like, he didn't do anything. The Spirit of God drew it out of him because of the hunger of God's people. Do you see what I'm saying? There's something about unity. God made us and designed us as a body in some funny way that, that, that the best preaching I've ever done in my entire life is when the people were so hungry for God, things start flowing out of you that you didn't even know where it came from. Because God has made us a body. And we have to be united in a hunger for the reality of his presence. But his presence will change everything in your life. You know, it becomes a dead form. When we, for, when we make it all about all the minors, have you sinned or not sinned? What is sin about? Breaking a relationship. What's the point? To get back in relationship. What, what did you tear down, Jesus? I tore down this wall. What was the wall? The wall separating you from God. What is the purpose? So you can come home. So you can be in the Father's presence. So that you can enjoy His presence. I see Him. The shout of a king is in her midst. Moses, Lord, if your presence doesn't go with us, then don't take us up from here. Because if your presence doesn't go with us, then we are no more than any other godless nation. In the world. God does not want us to live without his presence. Power of memory and imagination. I'm telling you. This, a pers all the things I'm sharing are hoping to paint pictures of what normal life should be as a Christian. I should live in his presence. 
but the power of imagining. Imagine your life. You walk with God. What will the Lord say over your life? You know, he was a pilgrim, a, a foreigner and a stranger in this world who sought a city whose builder and founder was God. He was like Elijah, zealous for the Lord as God. You know, the journey of our life and a lot of what we experience in life has to do with daring to dream and daring to believe that everything you read in God's word could be your life. Nothing that you read in God's word of any life that you see lived there is impossible for you to live because they're just the stories of people who walked with God. Isn't that exciting? And the power of memory. You know, when I talk about living in God's presence and finding out what makes you on fire for Jesus, I can tell you there's days in our lives, like for me, places in scripture, but also memories of God's faithfulness and goodness and his grace in our life is so powerful and so moving that all we have to do is sit and remember. You know, when Jesus says things, remember me in the breaking of bread. Remember me. And, and all I have to do is sit and remember God's faithfulness and answer to prayer. All I have to do is remember a day like yesterday in my daughter's senior thesis. And, and just other days, like you remember the Lord. And next thing you know, your heart is flowing in grace and thanksgiving and adoration. And then you let that love stir in you and you say, God, I want everybody in this world to know you. The tragedy of a life lived without their father in heaven, without knowing his presence and goodness and love. If you just take time to remember the journey that you, of your life and how God has been with you and remember the times when he was, you know, like you say in the marriage covenant, in, in good times and bad, in sickness and health. And as a Christian, you look back and what do you see? He was there through them all. And he was good. And he was faithful. And those times, they remembering it changes who we are. And I just encourage people, don't Live your lives without the presence of God. And if you need to find it, go back and visit the places that cause your hearts to reconnect with him. But it's it just as I was saying, it's sad that people should be in this world in bondage to the elements of this world or idols or darkness or sin. It's sad that a Christian should go any day without remembering the Lord and connecting with him and knowing his presence. Lord, give us this day our daily bread. I can't live without your presence, Lord. Mm. Moving on. We, we dream. You know, I said the power of imagination. And I love to dream. I do love to dream. And sometimes with the students, they like to let me dream. <laughs> and they say, that, that's good. You know, because... There, there's one guy that I, I haven't read in a long time, but I like to read him. I'm not going to say his name. I just, people who know me can figure it out, but I nicknamed him the one who must not be named. Because when I was going to be part of an executive committee and they found out you quoted in him some articles, they put me through a vetting process. You know, but he actually believed that this world could be rebuilt according to the pattern of heaven through the labor of human beings walking with God. And that's what got him in trouble. Because then you show people how. And the world doesn't like that very much. The kings of this earth, you know, or Babylon, the merchants of this earth who have made themselves rich through the great, do not like when kingdom of Messiah comes. Right? And he would dream, we'd dream about what would the world look like under the rule and reign of King Jesus. And it is wonderful to ponder and imagine and to dream how it could happen through the gospel of Jesus Christ to ponder these things. But one of the neatest things is that God has created us in his image. 
Things like curiosity are part of that image. Things like rationality are part of that image. And things like creativity are part of that image. You got a puppy. That puppy will never look in the house and say, you know, this house is dark. I like it when it's daytime, so I'm going to create a light bulb. Only men and women created in the image of God imagine a different world and have the ability to create it. Isn't that exciting and awesome? So, and that's why education is so important because it gives people the skills to take the dreams and bring them forth on the earth, right? And the most powerful education, and our founding fathers knew this, is in an education in God's word. Because if you want real skills and power and ability to recreate the world, listen. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, all scripture is breathed by God. It says inspired by God, but it means breathed by God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete. I want to be complete, Lord. I don't want to be half done building. The word of God is profitable to make you complete. Thoroughly, what does it mean to be complete? It means, well, I feel peace in my soul and happy, hallelujah, happy, clappy, praise the Lord. I'm going to heaven when I die. That, that's what it means to be complete. I'm not depressed anymore. Or I'm not discouraged. No, fully equipped for every good work. He wants us to be kingdom laborers, a people zealous for good works, a people who can dream and build power to go out into the world and rebuild it for the glory of God. And it says right there that scripture empowers us to do it. And we have to come to understand. See, I, I remember Lutheran Bible College and every sermon has to be Jesus died for your sins Law and gospel. You're a sinner. Jesus died for your sins. You get to go to heaven when you die because Jesus died for your sins. And I, I understand that there's a comfort level, especially like when people are coming out of darkness. Like I need to hear Jesus preached in the way that I understand and know that Jesus is being preached because I know that in him is life and outside of him is death. And I need the living true Jesus. And I get it. It's a desperation, and it's normal, it's natural in a babe of Christ to have that radical desperation and need to hear it very clearly, Jesus is Lord. But when we start to mature and we start to get a desire to be empowered and equipped to build every good work, then we come to understand that all Scripture is breathed by God. All Scripture is a testimony of Jesus Christ. All Scripture is able to bring forth the life of Christ in us. Isn't that exciting? It's radically exciting. And so when we leave pieces out of Scripture, or we overlook parts of Scripture, when we cut out parts of Scripture, we're robbing the world and robbing ourselves of the fullness of Christ. And it's being able to find Christ in all of Scripture that will empower us for every good work. Isn't that exciting? It's genuinely exciting. So I'm going to whip through the last three points. I got through two points in the next four minutes. So awakening the church. I'm hoping you're catching a picture and catching a dream and reviving expectation and seeing how we continue in this worldwide liberation movement. But call it awakening the church. Matthew, I'm just going to paraphrase it. To save what, half a minute. Jesus was going around everywhere doing signs and wonders and miracles and mighty works and proclaiming the kingdom of God. And a lot of people did love the mighty works and the miracles and the signs and wonders. And everybody was talking about the miracles and signs and wonders. Right? And then he went home and people had already heard about the miracles and signs and wonders. And when he got there, he was preaching with authority and then what happened is that he couldn't do anything. He couldn't do anything because they said, is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother and, are not his mother and brother here with us? 
And so even though Jesus was there in their midst, he could do nothing because of their unbelief. And I think that paints a picture of the time we're living in now where we're confronted with this reality that Jesus is Lord. He is on the throne. Messiah has come. His Holy Spirit has been poured out. Everything that we've just read about the worldwide liberation movement is true. Everything we read about the weapons of our warfare is true. Everything that we've read about the power of God's word is true. But it needs to be mixed with faith and expectancy. Because we get so used to business as usual. We get used to the level of his glory and presence that we've known. We, we, we fail to dare to dream and hunger and long and then search and become equipped to build something more powerful and glorious. And we need to break out and break forth and pray and seek him and say, Lord, we know that everything that we read in your word, everything we've heard in scripture, every great revival, these things are real or they're not. They can be experienced or not. And we say they can be and they will be if we are united to seek them together because all of God's body is required for the mission of the church in this worldwide liberation movement. But we need to break out and expect more and then diligently build and do the things that are calculated to bring more. And a lot of people don't want the responsibility of it. A lot of people don't want what is required of it. And people, if, we, if they're honest, they're content and if we're content, then we say, God, please pour out your love into my heart. Cause me to remember your goodness in my life so that I care enough about what you care about. God commands all men everywhere to repent. We're liberating you, all you people in darkness. The liberators are coming. What the gospel of Jesus Christ proclaimed through his people. It's like, listen, the Jews are being killed. Do they, should we liberate them or not? You know, the Nazi Germany. The, well, if we didn't care, that would be horrible. There are people all over this world that are living in bondage, in concentration camps of many types and sorts right here in our own communities. And they need the liberation that only comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we need to rebuild the house of God with his presence and glory and go and bring this worldwide liberation movement to the world. Skip it, skip it, skip it, skip it. See, we're going back when it says he will rule the nations with a rod of iron and he will tread the winepress of the wrath of God. See, people get so, I don't like that, that kind of language. It makes me feel uncomfortable, but it's God's word. But we do need to understand when we know God and his essential characteristic is love. What is it? He is so radically passionate about setting the world free that this language is explaining his passion that he wants to deliver people out of their concentration camps. He wants to set them free from their bondage. He wants to deliver them from their idolatry. He wants to bring life where there is death and light where there's darkness in this language Oh, oh, barely even scratches the surface of God's radical passion to set the world free. But he's ordained the church as his missionaries to a world in bondage and tasked us with the worldwide liberation movement that we call the Great Commission. The church is the epicenter of the worldwide liberation movement. And going back to what has been coming forth at these previous weeks, rebuild the church. 
and set the nations free. Get back to the weapons of our warfare that are mighty in God to pull down strongholds and they are not of the flesh. But they can demolish strongholds, liberate captives, and set the world free. When we walk with God, live in his presence, feed on his word, dare to dream, take time to remember, let his love possess our hearts and go with bold and expectant faith. God will use us to set the nations free. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. So I'm going to let Pastor David close us in prayer. And afterwards, people who want to pray can come up to the front right. If you want to pray for God's glory, pray for his presence, pray that God would thrust out laborers into the worldwide liberation movement. There will be other pastors up here who will pray for you. If you, if you have any need, we don't want you to leave without being prayed for. Or if it might be your own personal needs or it could be other needs that you want somebody to agree with you in prayer. But God does not want you to just live your Christian life alone without being empowered and encouraged and strengthened through the prayers of your brothers and sisters in Christ. With that, Amen, that's right. Will you stand with me as we are just thinking how to respond? And Lord, we do have this response ability. <laughs> You've created us with this incredible gift to respond. And so as we just stand here, Lord, I just pray that you would just touch each one of our hearts, one, each of our minds with this hunger, with this thirst, with this desire to move toward you, to get with you, to be touched by heaven, to, be, to hear from heaven, and to see from heaven. The journey to this adventure that you are calling us to. That life doesn't have to be a doldrum. Life doesn't have to be ho-hum. Life is not boring. That's not what you're after. You're after a deposit in us, Lord, that will give us a purpose. And also power and especially your presence to bring to the world around us. That's the reality that you're calling us to. Not just individually, but it starts right here, Lord, with me and with each one of us saying yes to you and then joining together, Lord, to become a force. And so we say yes this morning, Lord. We will respond and we will move toward you and we will do whatever it takes to sustain the life that you are stirring up within us in the mighty name of Jesus, amen. And Lord, we pray your blessing upon each one as they go forward until we meet again. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.